Hello everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilovepathology.com and supported by Wisdolia, which is an active learning platform. Starting from this session, I shall be discussing various aspects of pneumonia. And this is the part one of pneumonia where we will be learning about the epidemiology, the various defense mechanisms which protects us from in various infections. We will understand in detail about the pathogenesis of pneumonia and finally we will look into the classification of pneumonia. So the word pneumonia is derived from uh, Greek words pneumon and ia. Pneumon meaning lung and ia is just a suffix which means a state or condition. So basically pneumonia is a condition of the lung. In this case it is inflammation of the lung parenchyma. So, pneumonia by definition is the inflammation of lung parenchyma. We should realize that the respiratory tract infections are more frequent than infections of any other organ, upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract infections, of which the upper respiratory tract infections are more common, which includes common cold, you know, respiratory syncytial virus and other uh, various viral etiology. The World Health Organization, as per the WHO estimates, it is said that the death from pneumonia accounts approximately for around 15% of all deaths in children under the age of 5 years. The various people at risk for pneumonia include adults more than 65 years of age and those who have you know, comorbid conditions. Now, how does the microorganisms gain entry into the lung parenchyma? There are four different ways the microorganisms can enter into the lung. One is via inhalation, second is by aspiration of gastric contents, the third one is by hematogenesis or the blood uh, spread through a distant foci, and the fourth one is the direct spread from the adjacent foci of inflammation or infection. We should understand that normally the lungs or the airways are free of pathogens. That's because the respiratory tract has various defense mechanisms by which it can prevent the entry of organ microorganisms. So, what are the defense mechanisms? First and the foremost is the nose and trachea, which basically warm and humidify the air and it traps almost all the particles over 10 micrometer in diameter. So, any particle more than 10 micrometer are trapped within the nose and the trachea. Next comes the mucociliary blanket. Now, this is the mucociliary. You know that the respiratory tract is lined by pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And the mucus which is produced by the you know, mucus glands coats the inner layer of the respiratory tract. That is the mucociliary blanket which you know disposes of the particles which are around 2 to 10 micrometer in diameter and then you have alveoli which contains the alveolar macrophages which can you know phagocytose particles are of around 2 micrometer in diameter very small microorganisms you know less than 2 micrometer they are not really phagocytose and then they are exhaled this is the normal defense mechanism so when do you think one can expect development of pulmonary infection that is when there is decreased systemic resistance of the host that's the most important thing and second one is whenever there is impairment of the local defense mechanisms now what are all the conditions where the systemic resistance of the host is reduced if the uh, individual is suffering from various chronic diseases if the individual is having immunologic deficiencies, if he or she is on treatment with immunosuppressive agents or if the patient is having leukopenia that is reduced leukocyte count. So, these are the conditions where you have decreased systemic resistance of the host and then there can be proliferation of the microorganisms. To understand how immunologic deficiencies, you know, increases the susceptibility for infections by various microorganisms, we need to know the role of normal immune system. Firstly, let us understand the innate immune defenses. So, this is just a diagrammatic representation of the uh, distal part of the respiratory tract. So, that's the alveoli. These are the capillaries. Those are the microorganisms which gains entry into the distal airways. Most of these are tackled by the local defense mechanism in the form of the mucus, which I will be discussing in detail later. The alveolar macrophages, you know, it phagocytose, these bacilli. 
Apart from this, the macrophages, you know, they secrete certain factors which recruit the neutrophil into the alveoli. These are the complements which also enter the alveoli and will be activated by alternate pathway to produce C3B component. And you know C3B is an opsonin which helps in phagocytosis by the neutrophils. Microorganisms you know it gains entry into the regional lymph node through lymphatics and within the lymph node there is initiation of immune response. Here the lymphocytes are transformed into plasma cells which then secretes or produces lots and lots of immunoglobulins or antibodies okay, which can be IgA antibodies, IgM and IgG antibodies. These IgA molecules, they prevent attachment of the microorganisms into the you know respiratory lining. Rather, it blocks the attachment of the microorganisms to the respiratory lining thereby preventing infection. IgA plays a predominant role in the upper respiratory whereas in the lower respiratory tract you have these IgG and IgM antibodies which enters the alveoli. Remember IgG acts as opsonin which binds these microorganisms to enhance phagocytosis. These antibodies also activate the complements by classic pathway yielding more and more C3B which can further act as opsonins for phagocytosis. So this is what happens in innate as well as adaptive immune response. So whenever there is a deficiency of innate immune defense, for example, whenever there is defects in the neutrophils, defects in the macrophages, then we have increased susceptibility to infections, right? Similarly, whenever there is immunodeficiencies, if you don't have antibodies like IgA antibodies or IgG or IgM antibodies, then also there is increased susceptibility to develop infections. The second one is impairment of local defense mechanisms. The first important one we need to consider is if there is a loss or suppression of the cough reflex, this suppression leads to aspiration of the contents. The conditions associated with this or the risk factors associated with this is whenever the, whenever the person is in altered sensorium or whenever the patient is in, under anesthesia, there could be some neuromuscular disorders, some drug Drugs can also result in loss of, you know, or suppression of the cough reflex. Or if the patient is having chest pain, there can be a suppression of the cough reflex leading on to aspiration of the contents. The second one is the dysfunction of the mucociliary apparatus itself. The most common, you know, uh, etiologic agent for mucociliary apparatus dysfunction is the cigarette smoking, which has toxins which can destroy the mucociliary apparatus. It could be genetic defects as well, for example, immotile cilia syndrome. Various viral diseases could be inhalation of very hot or corrosive gases can, you know, disrupt the mucociliary apparatus. There can be accumulation of secretions which can result in, you know, uh, impairment of local defense mechanism. This is usually found in conditions where you have bronchial obstruction. Say, for example, if the patient is having increased secretion of, you know, bronchial mucus, bronchial mucus, as in the case of chronic bronchitis, it could be bronchial asthma, or even the case of cystic fibrosis, there will be accumulation of secretions. Alveolar macrophages, dysfunction. Okay, and the macrophages can be rendered functionless if he or she is exposed to alcohol, tobacco smoke, or anoxia, or even oxygen intoxication can result in alveolar macrophage dysfunction, leading on to impairment of the normal defense mechanism. And lastly, the, the cause could be either pulmonary congestion or even edema can lead to impairment of local defense mechanism. Whenever there is impairment of local defense mechanism or when there is decreased systemic resistance of the host, there can be entry of the pathogens into the lung parenchyma causing the disease. Now moving on to understanding the classification of pneumonias. There are many classifications of pneumonia. One is the etiologic classification where we classify pneumonias based on the etiologic agent. This is the most difficult one because most of the times you might not be able to find the exact etiologic agent. The second one is the, the most simplest one is the uh, uh, classification based on anatomic distribution of the inflammation. It could be lobar pneumonia, it could be lobular pneumonia or bronchopneumonia or it could be interstitial pneumonia. 
But unfortunately, this kind of classification can happen only when you do a lung biopsy or in the autopsy setting. So this cannot be useful for us clinicians, you know, to classify pneumonias. And the best way to classify pneumonias is based on clinical settings. So this can be further categorized into community acquired pneumonia. And by far, this is the most common cause of pneumonia. So this can be either bacterial or viral. The bacterial can further be categorized into typical or atypical. And the most common typical bacterial uh, you know, etiology is Streptococcus pneumoniae. And the next most common is Haemophilus influenzae. The second one is atypical, as I told you, it could be mycoplasma, it could be chlamydial infection, which can result in community acquired pneumonia. Community acquired viral pneumonias in the pre COVID era, it was respiratory syncytial virus, influenza, and para influenza viruses. Whereas now, in, after the COVID pandemic, you know, it is the coronavirus which is predominant virus affecting the you know, community acquired viral pneumonia. Of course, there can be respiratory syncytial virus, influenza, and para influenza virus as well. The second one is healthcare associated pneumonia. See, healthcare associated Pneumonia is basically defined as pneumonia which is occurring in patients who have had health care you know, contact in the last few months, in the last three months particularly. For example, if he or she has been hospitalized for more than two days in the last three months, if he or she had intravenous antibiotic therapy in the last few months, or if the individual is residing uh, in the hospital settings, so when these patients acquire infection, then it is referred to as healthcare associated pneumonia. And the most common organisms implicated are Staphylococcus aureus, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Streptococcus pneumoniae. And the third type of pneumonia is hospital acquired pneumonia. Now, this is also referred to as nosocomial pneumonia. This is basically an infection which occurs during the hospital stay for more than two days or 48 hours. Okay. And particularly, this is a type of pneumonia which occurs in a non-intubated patient. That's very, very important to note. And the organisms included, I mean, implicated in these cases are Lepsiella, E. coli and Pseudomonas. And the fourth one is the ventilator-associated pneumonia. You can say it as a subset of hospital-acquired pneumonia which occurs in patients who have been intubated by endotracheal tube for more than 2 days or 48 hours. The organisms implicated are Streptococcus pneumoniae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And the next one is pneumonia in immunocompromised individuals. So whenever the person is immunocompromised, you know, there is impairment of defense mechanism. So any organisms can be implicated. It would be the usual organisms which we have listed here, right? So apart from that, it can be cytomegalovirus, mycobacterium, avium intracellular complex, and most importantly, various fungal infections. And the fungal infections can be pneumocystis gyrovesi, it could be aspergillus, could be candida, could be mucormycosis, could be histoplasmosis, cryptococcosis, coccidioidomycosis, blastomycosis, and various other fungal infections can be seen in, in individuals who are immunocompromised. And the last one is the miscellaneous category, which includes aspiration pneumonia. It could be lipid pneumonia and it could be chronic pneumonias. For example, tuberculosis and even various chronic infections. So this is how one classifies pneumonia. Understand that it is the classification based on clinical setting is really useful for the clinician because in these settings, the clinician will know what organisms could be implicated, thereby treating these patients will be much simpler. So that is all for today's session. So now that you have watched the video completely, ensure that you click on the link below for a practice session. And this practice session is via Visdolia, where you can solve various multiple choice questions, short answers, as well as clinical scenarios. It is not just solving these questions, you can also get immediate feedback along with the explanation for the answers which you do not know. More importantly, this is fun to learn. So till now, we have learned about the epidemiology, the defense mechanisms, the pathogenesis and classification of pneumonia. In the next session, I shall be discussing in detail about community acquired pneumonia. Thank you for watching. If you have liked the video, hit the like button. Do comment.
if you have any queries to ask don't forget to subscribe if you are new to this channel and please do share if you find this content useful thank you